Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Michelle Vieira, Manager of Plant and Animal Sciences at PacBio, and I want to welcome you to the PacBio webinar series with today's topic focused on identifying and characterizing structural variation, among many other things, in the cannabis genome. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers who will present in the following order. First, we have Sarah Kingen, Staff Scientist at PacBio, followed by Kevin McKernan, Founder and Chief Science Officer at Medicinal Genomics. We have a lot of great material to cover today, and the presentation portion of the webinar will be followed by a questions and answers session. You're welcome to submit your questions at any point during the webinar by typing them in the area provided on your attendee dashboard, and I'll work to get them answered at the end. We will be recording this webinar and making it available for download in the next few days, so please keep an eye out for a follow-up email with a link to the recording. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Michelle. And thanks everyone for attending. Um, as Michelle said, my name is Sarah Kingen and I am a staff scientist at PacBio in bioinformatics applications. And it's my pleasure to begin the webinar today with an overview of how PacBio can be used for comprehensive analysis of complex genomes. I will begin uh, with an overview of the two modes of smart sequencing, continuous long read or CLR sequencing and highly accurate long reads also called HiFi. Then I will discuss some of the ways that these two data types can be used in applications such as genome assembly, structural variant analysis, and studies of RNA isoforms. So when we think of long read sequencing, we often think of there being a trade-off in terms of read length and accuracy, with the dominant sequencing technologies providing either very accurate short reads or less accurate long reads. For years, PacBio has provided continuous long read sequencing, abbreviated CLR. Users of the sequencing mode aim to get the longest possible reads through size selection of SmartBell library molecules shown at the top left of the, of the slide. This data type is ideal for genome assembly or structural variant detection. Because of PacBio's random error profile, high consensus accuracy can be achieved by combining information from different library molecules. Recently, we've seen innovations in sequencing chemistry that have enabled the widespread use of a second mode of sequencing called circular consensus sequencing, or CCS. As you know, through the circular topology of the SmartBell template molecule shown at the top right, it is possible with PacBio to sequence both strands of a double-stranded DNA molecule multiple times, thereby allowing for intramolecular consensus and leading to highly accurate long reads, which we call hi-fi reads. So this shakes up the idea of there being a trade-off between accuracy and read length by adding the PacBio hi-fi data type that is both long, reads can be between 10 and 20 KB in length, and accurate with hi-fi reads having accuracy higher than 99%. And for those of you who are um, new to PacBio, uh, we have recently released our new sequencing platform called the SQL2 system. The SQL2 system features an eight-fold higher throughput compared to the earlier machine, the SQL system. The underlying technology of SQL2 is similar to, to, to the SQL system, and the increased throughput translates to to significantly reduce project times and costs while having equivalent performance. So now let's see what you can do with first the CLR data type. For long DNA fragments using the CLR approach, you can collect reads as long as 175 kilobases with over half of the bases from a single smart cell run in reads greater than 50 KB. These reads are able to span large repeats across complex genomes and, as I said, have high consensus accuracy when used for genome assembly. As an example for genome assembly, here are the results from a collaboration that PacBio did with Oregon State researchers Dave Hendricks and John Henning, where we tackled the large and repeat-rich hops genome, which, as you know, is an important agricultural product used to flavor beer. Here I'm showing a comparison between the PacBio assembly and an earlier short read assembly. 
we sequenced the size selected CLR library in order to obtain more than 100 fold coverage of the HOPS genome. Our genome assembly, despite being lower coverage than the short read assembly, was more complete and more contiguous than the earlier short read assembly. More recently, in collaboration with the USDA Ag 100 Pest Initiative, which seeks to sequence insects and other arthropods that are pests on important agricultural crops, we released the first genome assembly generated with SQL2 data. We sequenced, again, a size-selected library, but this time on one SQL2 smart cell, and were able to assemble the 2.25 gigabase genome of the spotted lanternfly, which is an invasive insect decimating wine and pine farms in the northeastern United States. Similar to assembly, continuous long reads are useful for characterizing structural variants in plant genomes, for example. Here we looked for both small and large SVs between the rice reference genome and an indica subspecies known as MH63. Using a high quality genome assembly from high coverage PAC biodata as the ground truth for structural variants detected, we subsampled the PAC bio CLR data and called SVs using a mapping based method. And we were able to show that recall of insertions and deletions remains high, even down to tenfold coverage, providing a cost effective way to look at variants between species or cultivars. Now let's turn to applications using the HiFi data type. Like CLR data, HiFi reads can also be used for genome assembly. Here are the results for one smart cell of HiFi data from a 14 KB CCS library sequenced on SQL2 for the rice cultivar we saw previously, MH63. This one cell of HiFi data generated 40 fold coverage for the 400 megabase rice genome. The resulting assembly has high contiguity and very high base QV of 44, which translates into fewer than one error per 10 KB. In addition to the high base QV, the computation required for genome assembly with HiFi is much less than, the, than using CLR data. Although contig N50 values tend to be higher for assemblies done with CLR libraries compared to HiFi. PacBio can also do full-length RNA sequencing, which we call isoform sequencing or isoseq. HiFi data from the latest chemistry release analyzed with the latest bioinformatics pipeline, isoseq3, is able to recover 20% more genes per smart cell on average. In addition, my colleague Liz Tseng has developed algorithms to use genetic variation between two alleles to separate or phase transcripts into their appropriate alleles and call allele-specific splicing with a new, new tool called isophase. Lastly, we are working to improve the wet lab workflow for generating isoseq libraries and have an express workflow coming soon that reduces the amount of total RNA needed down to 300 nanograms and reduces the time to generate a library and gives more full-length transcripts with an increased average transcript length. So I want to close with a comparison between the performance of the SQL system to the new SQL2 system for HiFi reads. On the left, you can see that the read length distribution is similar for SQL and SQL2, although the throughput for SQL2 is eight times higher and generates um, an average of 16 gigabases of HiFi data per SQL2 smart cell. In addition to higher yield, SQL2 has higher raw read accuracy which translates into fewer passes around the smart bell library molecule that are needed to, to generate HiFi reads that are 99.9% .9 accurate, or QV30. For SQL2, we need only eight passes to achieve that, whereas the SQL system requires 10 passes. So to recap, what can you do with the SQL2 system? In a single smart cell 8M, you can run in CLR mode. You can generate a genome assembly for genomes up to two gigabases in size, as I showed with the spotted lanternfly. You can call structural variants across entire genomes. You can sequence a whole transcriptome. And furthermore, in the CCS mode, generating HiFi reads, you can determine the composition of more than 90 microbes in a metagenomic sample. 
or assemble a 500 to 800 megabase genome with HiFi data. And if you go on to sequence three to four smart cells of HiFi data, you can generate all variants in a human-sized genome and generate phase diploid human assemblies. So to end, I just wanted to um, thank all of you for listening and generally thank the scientific community for continuing to apply PacBio technology in their research. And now I will turn it over to Kevin and I'm happy to take questions at the end of the webinar. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate the introduction there. I think it's going to become very evident um, why this technology is playing such an important role in cannabis. Uh, we did attempt to sequence this genome in, in 2011 uh, with Illumina technology at the time, and it ended up in hundreds of thousands of pieces and has pretty much remained there for the last seven years. Um, until PacBio and, uh, and some of their long read technologies started to emerge, this number really hasn't changed dramatically. And so uh, we set out to do that last year. Uh, and to do so, we actually funded this in a fairly unique way. Uh, we, we turned to a cryptocurrency um, to fund this. Uh, and this is, a, this is a cryptocurrency known as Dash that was interested in solving some of the banking problems that exist in the cannabis industry. They forked off of Bitcoin in, uh, about five years ago and have been running ever since. But it's a different governance model than Bitcoin in that as opposed to having 100% of the, the mining rewards go to miners securing the network, they split this up a little bit to have 45% go to miners, 45% go to master node owners, and those master node owners have to stake 1,000 Dash on the network and, have, and provide certain computational resources to, to enable fast propagation of um, transactions, but they also get to vote on a treasury. And this treasury reached $8 million a month back in uh, December of 2017. And so we started applying for grants uh, to the Dash network uh, for them to vote and whether or not they wanted to uh, support research like this. And they decided to sequence the cannabis genome because they believe we need a seed to sell tracking system that's tied into a blockchain to, to, to really help move the field forward. And they figured a genome reference would, uh, would help do that. So, uh, we, tr we applied for this twice and failed. The third time, we finally got the funding. Uh, now, this is a really um, challenging way to get funding in that they can pull the funding at any 30 days. Uh, so every month, they re-vote. Uh, and you can get voted off the island in 30-day increments, which makes for a very fun project uh, that we decided to try to accomplish as quickly as possible uh, to avoid getting cut. Uh, so we started this in June 3rd last year. We began screening cannabis plants for those that synthesize both THC and CBD, you're going to hear a lot about three cannabinoids today, THC, CBD, and CBC. There are probably 90 or more in the plant you want to pay attention to, but those three are, are quite well studied today. Um, so we do have some genetic screens that we can use to track markers that predict what these plants are going to do. We didn't fully understand those loci until uh, we received this assembly, but we nonetheless had markers uh, that were predictive of them. Uh, we then, after we found type 2 female plants, uh, we wanted a female to start with because the genomes are smaller and easier to sequence. We then screened those on Illumina technology uh, to, to look for heterozygosity rates that were presumably low. Uh, and we wanted to start with low ones to ensure better assembly. The ones that were low, we graduated into pulse field gel, gel electrophoresis and high molecular weight DNA preps. Uh, we had a lot of help there with New England Biolabs and a few of the tricks that they have. Uh, we, we then um, graduated those onto, uh, I think these were version 5 chemistry to start with on 11 smart cells with PacBio. Uh, these got us 32,000 uh, base pair reads. Now, that read length is not a limitation of PacBio. It's a limitation of what we can get out of the plant. It's a very oily plant and difficult to isolate DNA. But nevertheless, uh, this, this uh, transformed itself into assembly by August 2nd, which we put public, uh, which had a 650 kb N50. Uh, I think the nearest um, assembly at this time was probably 150 KB N50 that was public, so this is a great improvement. Uh, but we figured there was more that we could do, uh, so we contacted Phase Genomics and applied some more Illumina reads to get contact maps through the uh, high c technology. And that did push the assemblies up to 5.4 megabase N50s, but those were scaffolded assemblies. So the high c data doesn't necessarily fill in your repeats, it just orders and orients your contigs. 
Um, and so we figured we really wanted to close some of those gaps and put on more version 6 chemistry, which the reads were longer and more accurate, and that pushed the nucleotide N50, the actual raw sequence assembly, out to 3.7 megabases. Now, uh, we published all of this work uh, into a preprint server, and we're also careful to hash a lot of the key experimental data into the Dash blockchain. This is a way of providing censorship-resistant uh, publication, and the reason we were doing this is we had five months to complete this, and we've been through this peer review process many times before. Uh, we've captured many uh, um, journal covers with various very interesting genome projects, but we think we're moving into a world where genome publications need to be as automated as YouTube uploads. Uh, we need an algorithmic way to verify that sequence is in fact real, uh, because the rate at which PacBio and Illumina and other parties are improving, uh, this is where it's going to go, is we're going to see people doing sequences in the field, perhaps, and even being able to upload them. The peer review process, while still very valuable, we think um, needs maybe some speciation. And so we thought about trying to, to automate this a little bit more by utilizing a blockchain, uh, by basically utilizing cryptocurrencies to incentivize reviewers to come and review the work and to put their name on the review and to put it public and to also put declarations that they have no conflicts of interest public other than the, the review incentive, uh, and that all of this communication is now public and online for people to review. Uh, many people call this a bribe. Uh, we are quite pleased in that it took seven days to review a genome, and we had people point out several details in terms of how we are you know, running Busco incorrectly or correctly, and the, the, the reviewers really contributed to this paper, and I think you can see that online. So this is an experiment. Uh, we don't think it's going to replace normal peer review, but we do think peer-to-peer uh, -peer, peer review is probably coming for things that are more automated, like genome sequencing and, and genome assembly. Uh, the best peer review you can get, actually, and this happened to us, is someone else downloading your data after you put it public and getting a publication out before you have. <laughs> and this is a great uh, publication that's in a preprint right now from um, a group down, I believe, in, in, uh, in Maryland that sequenced, a, uh, looked at the, uh, the cannabis proteome, and were able to align that back to various references and found that uh, the Jamaican line, in fact, contains most of the proteome. Um, and this, this lines up with the BUSCO results that we have for the assembly. Uh, and ultimately, this is really the type of peer review you want to see, is other people taking the data and, and making use of it. And, and the Aiden Laboratory downloaded some of the data as well. We thank them for this. They went to clean up some of our high seed maps, uh, and they were able to, to dr drastically improve them. There is still some haplotate contamination we're sorting through, and I think you're going to see the Pan Genome Project that we're about to display um, resolve uh, a good portion of that. One thing we did learn throughout this process is about 30% of the Jamaican lion genome is not mappable with 2 by 150 uh, Illumina reads. Uh, those are 150 base pair paired reads. Uh, they end up having a mapping quality of less than 10, and they're very difficult to place. And this does play a role in doing linkage maps and doing high seed data, because uh, these all rely on, on Illumina. Um, nevertheless, we are, were able to identify 30 different THC synthase-like sequences. These are the genes that fold a lot of the, the cannabigerol precursors into cannabinoids. Uh, and I mentioned three at the beginning, but there are arguably um, 90 or more of these in the genome, and uh, there's at least 30 that we believe are, um, are of greater than 80% identity to THC synthase, and about 18 that look like they have uninterrupted um, uh, CDSs, uh, coding sequences, start codon and stop codons. Um, now, this is looking at synthases that are a single exon only, and I'm going to touch on why that's important a little bit later. Um, but here's a look at uh, some of these clusters. So the, the top cluster here is, um, is uh, cannabichromine synthase. Uh, prior to having this assembly, this all looked like a single contig in Illumina data because it collapsed these genes, which were about 99, over 99% identical, but they were separated by LTRs, 16 KB LTRs that were usually tandemly arrayed, so they were 32 or 64 or 96 kilobase uh, repeat segments. Now, this has been a problem for a lot of platforms, particularly long read platforms that don't have accuracy, the challenge that they've had is that they are utilizing Illumina data to error correct um, regions like this, and this region is not very mappable with Illumina. So the error correction process is only as good as the mappability of the underlying Illumina data, uh, and this region we think really benefited by having highly accurate long reads. Um, likewise, the THC synthase um, contig is in here as well. Um, sorry, these hash marks are pretty small, but you can see 
there are other cannabinoid-like genes that are expressed uh, in here that we're going to touch on with some of the isoseq data we have on here. Uh, and likewise, the CBDA synthase gene. So these are the three ones we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and you can see that they're arrayed in some uh, really complicated structures here. Um, then they were really only resolved with some of the long read sequencing. Now, part of the reason why this is a difficult genome to assemble and error correct is because it's very polymorphic. Uh, this is the polymorphism rate across uh, 20 whole genome shotgun samples and over 100 uh, strain seq samples. Strain seq is a system that uses SureSelect to do exon capture and sequences a micro exome and a bunch of other markers in the genome. Uh, and it has fairly similar polymorphism rates as the whole genome shotgun data. Um, the ancestor Jamaican lion down there is, of course, a low polymorphism rate because it's very related to the, uh, the mother line that was sequenced. But this is what is complicating the genome assembly, is we have uh, not only a polymorphic genome, but one that varies um, quite a bit sample to sample. Uh, the other interesting thing that the long read data pointed out to us uh, is that uh, when we did this assembly, we ended up with eight or more contigs for the chloroplast genome. And this was a bit of a surprise to us. Part of this is because we had extraordinarily high depth of coverage. We didn't do a nuclei prep, so we ended up with 10,000 X coverage or more over some of these regions. Uh, but the other region, uh, other reason this is very interesting to us is we know that there are nuclear plastid sequences. Uh, this is quite common with organellular sequences. They transfer sequence back and forth to the nucleus, and they can sometimes be more difficult to discern if, uh, if whether or not they're nuclear or, or organellular. The long read data helps uh, really clean that up quite a bit, and you can confirm it with methylation status. Uh, the, or, the, uh, the chloroplast genome is unmethylated, and the nuclear uh, sequences are usually methylated. And so we used a combination of these tools to sort out which ones were nuclear and which ones were, in fact, different, um, uh, different chloroplast uh, haplotypes, if you will. Now, um, we are still sorting through what this means, um, but there is a very interesting paper um, that uh, seems to synergize with this data. Arnold Bendage published some really interesting work demonstrating that chloroplast genomes are never circular, or very rarely circular. They're, in fact, they rely on these inverted repeats to replicate, and this is much like a whole genome amplification reaction that creates a hydra. And so you get these photocompetent um, contigs that could be coming off of the circle, and that's what we think we're actually seeing here. Um, many of the differences in uh, the haplogroups here are, in fact, homopolymer errors or, or repeats. We don't know if it's actually a sequencing error or a native polymerase error, but there are some SNPs that don't look like they're slippage related, that look as if they're, in fact, real variants that differ among some of these contigs, uh, and that may play an important role in understanding yield. Um, yield in plants is the most easiest target to improve yield on plants is the chloroplast genome, and so we really have to understand this thing cold if we want to um, do anything to improve the photosynthesis. Um, so the methylation technique that we used, uh, while the single molecule tools are great at figuring some of this out from, for CPG, plants are a little dirtier. They have different forms of methylation that can sometimes make it more difficult to pick up at a single molecule level, and so we turn to by a by method of bisulfite sequencing to try and verify this. Um, now, this can be very, very tricky because bisulfite uh, converts um, things to more AT content, right? So this genome is already 66% AT, and uh, we had to um, convert this, and it ends up being 83% AT, and, of course, the reference then becomes twice as big in the process. So um, the mapping of this data can be very tricky. We did this uh, mostly on Dragon. Uh, and uh, I think they're using BWA meth for that. And uh, this method, however, that New England Biolabs came up with has a uh, much better GC balance in the library and also has a much more complete conversion rate, which they confirmed with various techniques like um, HPLC. So it's a very um, slick method that affords longer inserts on aluminum and uh, can give you some methylation status. So we did this across five tissues. Um, against uh, female flower, male flower, female root, female leaf, and then female seeded flower. We did uh, the methylation maps, and we also did isoseq sequencing on all of these. And so now we have great uh, RNA information overlaid with methylation information. And what you can see is that certain genes that you expect to be hypo or hypermethylated, in fact, do so. So we're looking at the adestin gene here. Adestin is a gene that makes the seed content in the plant. It's a globulin that uh, is responsible for hemp having such a diverse amino acid profile and being such a strong food source. Uh, well, this particular gene you can see is under-methylated uh, or hypo-methylated in the male 
flowers and in the female seeded flowers as we would expect. As the, the, the plant starts to seed, it starts creating a destin, so it needs to turn the destin gene on, and we start to see unmethylated regions of the genome emerge uh, with RNA um, expression as well to, to um, confirm this. So there's a variety of different forms of methylation in plants, uh, CPG, CHG, and CHH. This is largely the reason why it's more difficult to ascertain methylation status in plants, uh, and also more difficult to sequence plant genomic sequencing through either nanopores and sometimes even um, single molecule sequencers, because they create different interpulse distances that can make it more challenging for you to base call. But nevertheless, um, with these, uh, these Illumina sequences, we, we can't map the entire genome this way, but small portions of it we can, and we can certainly capture differential methylation that you're seeing in the scatter plot on the right. Uh, and with this, uh, we zeroed in on about 770 sites that were hypermethylated for the seeds and about 534 sites that were undermethylated for the seeds. And this is what really zeroed us in on the Adestin gene as being um, one of these interesting regions. And the other region that popped out, not surprisingly, uh, is the region that makes THC. And it's, it's been well known in the field that male flowers don't make a lot of THC, and female flowers are how you produce high quantities of them. And you can see the female seeded flowers and the female flowers are all unmethylated in this region of the genome, therefore turning gene expression on and then giving you higher rates of, uh, of THC synthase messenger RNA expression, whereas the male flowers presumably are methylated and have this RNA region turned off. Um, now that brings us to looking at RNA. You, once you have isoseq data, you can now get a better understanding of what gene content you have in the genome and how many isoforms you have. Now, these are the different isoforms, um, number, number of counts that we're finding in each tissue. The male flowers surprisingly have more than the rest. That's a bit of a surprise to us. Um, but the other um, thing that we did once we had this isoform information is that you can then take that data and feed it to algorithms like Maker that can then build an HMM model for your, your genes in your genome and then go and do ab initio predictions of the regions that weren't expressing in the tissues that you surveyed. We only surveyed five tissues here. Arguably, there's other gene expression going on in tissues that we haven't, um, that we haven't yet surveyed. So you want to have these tools go and find the genes that, that are based on models from the other genes in the same genome. And in doing this, we end up with around 27,664 genes. And this brings us to about a 44 megabase exome. So it's an exome that's larger than human uh, with a coding uh, sequence of about 34 megabases. Now, if you include all of the introns in this gene space, it ends up being about 121 megabases. So there's a tremendous amount of space uh, in the genome that's covered with, uh, with genes uh, and some very large uh, introns as well. Now, um, we ran uh, a system just to give you some, some backup on how, on how we perform this. This was done with repeat modeler first. You first have to identify where your repeats are in the genome. We couldn't do this with Illumina very accurately. We now have really good resolution on 16 KB repeat structures based on the PAC bio read length. Once you understand where those are, you can feed that into Maker and then go through several rounds of training Maker on the genome with your messenger RNA transcripts and come out with really strong gene models. Uh, and then you usually filter those based on things that have support with, uh, with ISOSeq, and that's what led us to around uh, 27,000 genes. Um, and so here's a, a real interesting region of the genome. This is the cannabichromine gene cluster where there's absolutely no RNA expression in four different tissues that we surveyed here. Uh, the fifth one's missing, I'll have to add that in, but it, we, I don't think we see it there either. But interestingly enough, on the sides of this gene cluster, are genes uh, that are involved in pathogen defense, which we had uh, we didn't know about until this genome was uh, was discontiguous. There's anchorin expression and molectin expression, both up and downstream of the cannabichromine gene cluster. And cannabichromine is known to be an antiseptic compound, so this is probably not too surprising that it's found inside of a region that has other genes involved in pathogen defense. Um, likewise, if you look at the THC synthase region, we have several other uh, THC synthase-like genes scattered around the genome, all expressing in, in tissue-specific manners. So there's a berberine bridge synthase gene over here. This one actually has an intron. We did not think cannabinoid synthases had introns. Uh, this one does, uh, and it is in frame, which is really interesting. Um, and then there's a, there's a couple transposases that are flanking this cassette. So perhaps this gene is replicating throughout the genome with these transposons. Uh, and there's a couple other um, FAD-linked oxidases. This is another fancy way of saying it's a synthase. These have the same PFAM ID as TAC synthase. And there's a couple other ones here to the right that are, in fact, expressed as well. So there's a lot going on in these cannabinoid clusters. And you can see in, uh, horizontally here, each tissue seems to have a different agenda with what it wants uh, to put forward. 
Um, there's just the uh, the PFAM designation, and in fact, the intron for that that synthase uh, with an intron, which is which is um, quite interesting. Now, here's um, another interesting region uh, that is uh, in, in encompasses the uh, the CBDA synthase. Here's uh, a, a one particular tissue that is expressing this plant self incompatibility protein just downstream of CBD synthase. Um, this is something that relates to pollen and, and making self-pollination incompatible. So we have to look into what that means because everyone in the field is very interested in making double haploids and, and perhaps apomixis. Uh, maybe these, uh, these genes may, may, may play a role. Uh, now, when you look at CBDS, uh, this is zoomed out quite a bit, so it looks like a tiny line here. It's, in fact, a 2KB gene. Uh, what you can see scattered around this region are a variety of other novel synthases, and then this S1 is that incompatibility gene just upstream of it. Um, so there's there's a lot going on here that seems to be tissue specific and uh, might lead us to find some other synthases to uh, resurrect some of these other cannabinoids that seem to have been bred out of the population. Uh, another interesting attribute of isoseq data is you can see alternate splicing as seen here in the parental transferase 1 gene that John Page has published quite a bit on. This makes a particular portion of the cannabinoid synthesis pathway upstream. It's responsible for, for, for linking GPP into, um, into cannabinoid acid. And it's possible it can make two different forms of this molecule, although the plant seems to predominantly make one. These isoforms may lead us to um, a path to make the other. So there's, uh, this has never been seen before until we had data and a genome of this quality to compare it to. We've also been looking through the terpene synthase genes. These are the, the compounds of the plant that give it the aroma, and of course there is some pharmacological effect of these. It's currently being studied. But the most highly expressed terpene in this plant is beta carotene and bisabolo, and we've been able to identify which, the, which genes encode those, and they are in fact uh, have, have very, very deep RNA expression over them. So there, there's some concordance with the chemotype and the RNA expression, which is quite um, fantastic to see. And then finally, we took the, RNA, the ISOSeq data and tried to sort out what the Y chromosome is. Okay, so we have a male flower RNA, and if you take that and you map it to the female reference, and then take the unmapped reads from that, which presumably are not female, and then map those back to a male assembly, which we're going to show you in just a moment. We have one of those two. This decorates which one of the contigs in the male genome are putatively Y chromosome. And this turns into about 118 megabases of genomic DNA, about 65 contigs with an N50 of 3 meg. Um, there's about 427 busco genes in there. And in fact, the XY marker we developed many years ago does fall into the set. And the size of this chromosome seems to fall in line with the, cytoge the cytogenetic evidence from Divashuk uh, that has been published before. So uh, I think we've got a good picture of the Y chromosome now, and that may help us um, sort out hermaphroditism. So uh, what is a cannabis pan genome project? Well, what we wanted to do once we had one good reference uh, is sequence a trio. So we can do trio binning and try and phase the genome um, uh, with, with PAC bio data alone. We're, we're a little bit nervous about utilizing uh, Illumina only for this, uh, based on the mappability of those reads. And so um, we set out and sequenced the, uh, the brother of the Jamaican lion strain and then one of its offspring. Um, and the reason we want to do this, just to back up a little bit, um, Sarah gave a great presentation here on the types of structural variation that you can find, but just for the general audience here, you're probably used to hearing a lot about SNPs. These are single nucleotide variants or polymorphisms. And that's, uh, you can see from this chart, that represents a good portion of the variation in the genome. But if you actually go outside of that to look at uh, double nucleotide variants or insertions and deletions under 50 bases, uh, you can probably capture those with the Lumina sequencing. It's a little bit more difficult to capture those with SNP chips. Um, and the Lumina sequencing doesn't necessarily capture them all at the 50 base pair range, but it does a fairly decent job of getting them. There's as many variants in genomes that are more than single nucleotide than there are single nucleotide ones. Um, and likewise, when you go out into the structural variants, while they might be fewer in number, they encompass larger portions of the genome because of their size. And so the vast majority of, of many genomes are, in fact, fall into the bin of structural variation. And there's a slide here from Pacific Biosciences just to draw this out. Uh, in humans, this number is perhaps fairly small compared to where it ends up with plants like corn and maize. You can see there's about 71 megabases of structural variation in that genome, and zebrafish, it gets even higher. Um, and these are very, very difficult to detect with short reads. In fact, uh, if you look at this slide for PacBio, it demonstrates the ability to pick these things up with various technologies is quite poor if you're using short reads. But when you get into the long reads, you begin to see them all. 
uh, and that's going to become very critical in evaluating cannabis genomes. So here are the assemblies we have to date. We have a trio done now. There's about two, over 200 gig of sequence on, uh, on uh, CLR um, sequencing on SQL2 and 155 on SQL2 with CLR as well for the offspring. Uh, we're still in the assembly process of the offspring, but if it ends up anything like the other two genomes, we're expecting, uh, you know, megabase size in 50s with BUSCO scores north of 90%. Um, the original Jamaican line, I think BUSCO is closer to 97%. Uh, we expect the, the male genome to be more complicated. There's, a, there's 118 megabase uh, Y chromosome in there. That's the largest chromosome in cannabis, and of course that makes it a bigger genome and more difficult to assemble. Um, but nevertheless, once this is done and you run PBSV over this, which is a PAC biostructural variant calling system, uh, it begins to identify multiple different uh, heterozygous and homozygous deletions in both the male flower and in the offspring. Uh, and the offspring is a female, so the, the differences you're seeing here may, may in fact have um, something to do with, uh, with sex, but all of this data was mapped against a female. Uh, okay, so we started with a uh, female reference, and there's a female offspring that's getting mapped to it, and there's a male getting mapped to it, and we're detecting SVs in that. Nevertheless, uh, this is over 116 megabases of structural variation in a closely related trio. This, uh, these are you know, brother, sister, offspring, and the breeder who bred this had claimed to have backcrossed this already 10 times. So um, that is a, a, an eighth of the genome that has 24 busco genes in it that is in structural variation. So um, this really makes you change the way you think about approaching sequencing this genome with other resequencing tools. To put it into context with humans, we're seeing about 7 meg of structural variation in humans from the previous slide, a similar number of events, but perhaps a little bit smaller in a genome that's much bigger and less polymorphic. So uh, we tried to confirm this, uh, and the way that we've been confirming this is we did 40 whole genome shotguns on Illumina, over 50x coverage on these. We've been mapping these with both Dragon and Parabrix because mapping in cannabis needs to be tuned uh, a little bit more than, than uh, how these algorithms have been tuned in human. And you can see the, um, the, the highest mapping rates are with the Jamaican lion strains. As we would expect, those ones are mapping over 90%. But many of the other genomes are not mapping to that rate, and we believe that is an artifact of the structural variations that might exist in those genomes, that we do not have a reference, a pan-genome reference yet, but we're about to have that with the work that's been done um, throughout this presentation, is we're going to need to start including many of the contigs that are in those other assemblies, the SV events, so that we can, we can push the mapping rate even higher. Now, we don't think this mapping rate is going to go to 100% just due to the mappability of the genome. Uh, we are seeing about 30% of the reads, or 30% of the genome is completely unmappable with 2 by 150 uh, luminous. Now, if you look into the regions of the genomes where we're seeing some of these structural variants occur, they're in very interesting set of genes known as the terpene synthase genes. Among others, these, some of these are in there. Uh, so this is, these are the genes that fold GPP into monoterpenes. These are known as, there's a couple different families here, family A, B, and C, but these are happening, I think, mostly in family B that we're seeing some structural variations. Um, this is a bit of a map of those different terpenes and how this, this terpene pathway is, in fact, uh, a precursor to the cannabinoid terpene pathway. So when you start making aberrations in the terpene pathway, we expect there to be some impact on the availability of the precursors for the cannabinoids. Now, um, so these are the terpene synthase genes that we found in structural variations so far. Terpene synthase number 17, which is thought to be a beta myrcene, and this strain has been known to be sometimes beta myrcene negative and sometimes beta myrcene dominant. Um, beta caryophyllene is the other uh, terpene that it seems to make, and uh, and um, and bisabolo. And then likewise, there's another gene uh, that has six exons missing in TPS30. We don't yet know if this is destroying the functionality of these genes, but we suspect it is. Um, and these may be changing the ratios of a variety of these, these different terpenes. Now, there's a couple other terpene genes listed here. Um, these ones were minor, they were blast hits, but not 100% blast hits, so that's probably just homology between the other terpene genes and these genes. We don't, in fact, think those are all deleted. We just think it's one set of deletions here, uh, particularly in TPS30 and TPS17 that are, that are within the structural variation map. So in, in one given cross, you can see uh, genes related to chemotype either coming and going based on structural variation. And this does play some, have some implications for what we do going forward. We were approached um, to make SNP chips for this by Illumina and AFI just after we published the genome in August, and we held off, and that was probably a good idea, because now that we have a better picture of this genome, 
we can de perhaps design a more intelligent chip, but it's still not an easy problem. We've got to sniff every 94 bases. We now know there's a million in indels in every genome, and 20 to 35% of the genome is not mappable. That, that range is dependent on which mapper you use, and that range is mostly, uh, you know, MAQ score is under 10. Uh, so they're arguing over some of the dirtier regions of the genome, but nevertheless, it's a large portion of the genome that's not mappable to 2 by 150. It may be even harder to, to access that region of the genome with 30 base pair oligos on SNP chips. Um, so we suspect the mappability and the placement of SNP chips is going to be even harder than the sequencing. And now we know there's about 12% of the genome that has structural variation greater than a KB, and that these contain very important genes and structural vari that are in involved in the chemotype. So, we opted to stay with sequencing because sequencing can be done without primer design. You can shear up DNA, glue on primers, and sequence, and then you have a primer-free method of surveying the genome. Genotyping needs to dance around all this variation, and I don't think our maps are complete yet. Uh, we need to sequence some more hemp lines and a few other lines to make sure those chips can, can uh, weave their way through all of this variation. So what do we do with this? Uh, well, we have a blockchain-based uh, registration system that helps people certify their hemp lines and their cannabis strains uh, with um, sequencing. And this is needed for sometimes IP protection, sometimes for IP defense, and sometimes just to learn what your strain is related to and what to breed it with. This is a phylogenetic tree of probably 500 different strains that have been sequenced. Uh, and we can readily pull out the BTBD allele, which is the allele that decides whether the plant makes CBD or THC. We now have this beautifully resolved with PAC biodata. In the past, this was a very collapsed region with alumina. It was very difficult for us to call the, the variants outside of those regions to make a call on whether it was going to be type 1, 2, or 3. Uh, this is pertinent to some cannabis patents that have issued on type 2 plants, so you need to know whether you have a type 2 plant because um, there are property rights over those, at least in the United States and in Canada. Uh, and it's also helped to give you an understanding of uh, how distantly related your strain is, what to breed it with, and how to get it um, public and certified in a way that can, uh, that can be helpful for prior art generation. Uh, this is that particular loci in the BTBD allele. You can see the Illumina coverage maps over these loci um, can predict whether you are going to be a THC generating plant, which is a type 1, a, a THC CBD generating plant, which is a type 2, or a CBD only generating plant, which is a type 3. And there is, in fact, a type 4 where there's knockouts in both genes, and you end up making the precursor only, which is known as cannabigerol. Uh, there are some folks now bringing these to market out in Oregon, known as Oregon CBD, and these are some of the first 14% CBG lines that we've seen, uh, and we're really excited about um, how the, the, the the, the, the genomics is now turning into actual um, products in the marketplace with, uh, with intelligent breeding. Uh, a lot of this data is public. We encourage people to download it. Many other pe more people have published on the data than we have, so we like that. Um, feel free to do it yourself. Um, there's a variety of, of publications that are scraping this data and beginning to use it. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great resource for the community uh, because you can do things like this with this. This is actually a fluorescent lamp assay that's designed to target the mRNA coming off of the CBD allele. So if we really want to nail the legal definition of hemp, type 1, 2, and 3 doesn't really satisfy the DEA. They want to see stuff under 0.3% THC. And we don't think the genome alone is going to predict that. We think you're going to need RNA to really nail it. Uh, and so we began making uh, reverse, you know, RT lamp assays that could then look for the CBD allele and measure and quantitate the RNA expression levels of that gene. Uh, and uh, we're hopeful that this will be uh, will lead us toward an assay that can, in fact, tell you whether your plant's going to hit 0.3 or not based on, on gene expression as opposed to genetics. Um, so this is, uh, this is something that was not possible until we really had a good understanding of the reference, and now we can think about doing this on all the terpene um, synthase genes, on all the cannabinoid genes. Uh, you know, gene expression arrays are on the way. I think that's what we're going to start to see. Uh, a lot of people helped on this. Um, we had funding from DASH, as mentioned before, and we could not have assembled this genome without PacBio. That's pretty clear. We spent seven years really, you know, polishing an Illumina uh, knot, and that uh, was really only unveiled uh, when PacBio came to the table. Uh, in, in many ways, they have enabled Illumina to do some other work on the genome as a result of this. Uh, and then there's the methylation work that was uh, really uh, not something we thought was even possible given how AT rich the genome is, but we were able to find some very interesting biological signals from that. Uh, and then the phage genomics really helped us with the, uh, the HI-C and the 3D genomes, and Parabrix has been doing a lot of GPU acceleration to try and speed up the variant call formats uh, generation on these things with um, GPU accelerated work in the Google Cloud. Uh, and ICANN has, has helped us with the LAMP assays. 
Uh, the folks at Medicinal Genomics, I want to make sure we recognize here, many people have been uh, slaving away at this for over a year now, Vaughn and Liam and Kyle and Biao in particular have really um, chipped in on making this genome reference public and high quality, and our collaborators, Sarah and Primo and Eileen and the team at NEB uh, in phase and phase genomics have, uh, have, 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 have slaved at this uh, for a good many, many months now so that we have the references that we have. This is, uh, it's, it's, it's really a good time to be in genomics in the cannabis field, and it wouldn't have been possible without all these folks contributing. So I want to thank them for that. And with that, I think we can, we can, uh, we can turn it to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin and Sarah, for those great presentations. Um, like Kevin said, we will go ahead and begin the question and answer session. Um, if you have a question and have not yet posted it in the questions portion of your attendee dashboard, please uh, feel free to do so, and we will continue to take questions. So the first question is for Sarah, and it is, how do you know your hop assembly is more complete and not duplicated instead? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and the answer is that it's actually both. Um, so one of the ways that we typically look at um, the completeness and the level of um, duplication in terms of, of haplotypes in the um, primary contigs of a Falcon assembly is to run BUSCO, which looks for um, conserved genes in um, the, uh, the taxon, you know, a set of species, um, you know, genome assemblies from related taxa. Um, and so with the hops assembly, I think we were about 87% complete and over 30% duplicated. So there was a fair amount of curation that we ended up having to do to remove the duplicated haplotypes um, in the hops assembly so that we could, um, you know, have a, a nice well curated haploid version of the genome. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is for Kevin. Um, do you think the large number of structural variants in the trio could be driven uh, by active transposable elements? Uh, that is a great question, and it is something we need to look a little further in because of these um, these transpose transposases that seem to be flanking some of these interesting cannabinoid genes. It certainly has has that on our mind. Um, I was actually expecting there to be no genes in the SV map when this came at us because I assumed it was some of this repeat content just shuffling around it's in the genome and, and probably having no impact, but was quite taken aback when we realized there's not only genes but BUSCO genes that are in there. Um, so we, we have more work to do on exactly what is driving that recombination and why it is, is so prevalent in, in cannabis, but uh, it's, a, it's a question I, I really can't answer yet. Okie dokie. Next question is for Sarah. Um, you report the recall for SV detection in the rice genome, but what about the specificity of variants? Have you done any validation? Yeah, we, we have. Um, so we tend to measure um, precision or uh, positive predictive value, not specificity, when we're looking, when we're validating the SV calls. Um, and so in humans, which we've worked up very extensively, we see that um, uh, precision is greater than 95% at all coverage levels, um, and these results are pretty similar for the RICE data that I presented as well. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is for Kevin. Um, do you have recommended varieties for flowers that resemble THC containing flowers that have high CBD, uh, low THC traits? Uh, well, we pro there are probably some on Canopedia. You can now search through Canopedia and look at uh, which samples have um, BT, BD alleles that, that, that signify whether it's type 1, type 2, or type 3 plants. Um, and some of those uh, folks have their contact information on, on their page, and you can contact them if you're looking to, to, um, uh, to access that, that material. Uh, as, as many, some people may not know, but since the Farm Bill came through in 2018, it's probably, I think it's legal now to send hemp samples, high CBD, type 3 plants in the mail, as long as you can document and prove that it's below 0.3%. Um, type 2s and type 1s are still a question mark as to how those can ship in the mail. They, you can probably only get DNA in the mail as opposed to flowers. So uh, just be aware of those different legal restrictions. Um, if not, contact us afterwards and we can try and uh, walk you through uh, a few of the, um, you know, the samples that we have in Canopedia that might meet the description of what you're looking for. Great, thanks, Kevin. Um, next question for Sarah, a more uh, practical question. 
um, can you start an ISOSeq library with total RNA or do you need to separate RNA into different sizes? And what is the bias for RNA link? Yeah, um, so you can use whole RNA without um, splitting into different size fractions. Um, and generally speaking, there there isn't a lot of bias in terms of the, the transcript length on either SQL or SQL 2. Great, thank you. Um, another one for Kevin here. How do structural variants affect dominant terpene expression, and how do you think that will tie into the biotech LLC patent? Okay, so that's a complicated question. Um, I'm not a patent attorney, but uh, I think the, the, the question is really driving around the fact that the biotech LSC patent speaks of a BTBD allele and uh, strains where myrcene is not the dominant terpene. Um, and the question that exists on that patent is whether those strains existed before the patent was filed in 2013. Um, we think they may have, and Jamaican Lion may have been one of them, but um, you know, whether or not the audit trail on that's going to survive legal scrutiny is unknown. Um, but what is known is that Biotech LLC made seeds, and if the process of making seeds had this much structural variation in it, I'm somewhat suspect that those seeds will come out with the same terpene profiles as uh, the parents. Um, but, but we'll have to see. Right now, those seeds you cannot access in the United States. They, they can't ship those seeds into the United States. And the Farm Bill may have changed that, but in 2000, we started this project that was not possible. So. Um, that's an open question. We are seeing parts of the myrcene pathway be deleted just in a trio like this. Uh, this is a, a back cross you know, cultivar that uh, that had offspring, just just like the seed that they submitted to the um, to the bank. So um, I think it's a very good question, but it's an open question that uh, is probably going to need someone with more um, letters after their name than mine. Great, thanks. And, and sticking with you, Kevin, um, going back to uh, regarding the 0.3% hemp definition, might a plant have high THCA yet low THC and be rated as hemp? Uh, that is a good question. I don't know how um, that's going to be interpreted. So for those who aren't familiar with this, THCA is the precursor. That's what the plant makes. Uh, you need heat to break it down to THC, and THC is what is Schedule 1. Depending on your interpretation of the farm bill, um, I've heard Delta-8 might be legal now, Delta-8 THC, as well as is all the other cannabinoids, but um, the Farm Bill um, is, is open to interpretation right now, so we're kind of curious to see uh, what happens with it. Um, so I think the question was asking, uh, what if your plant has high THCA but no THC? In other words, it's, there's no degradation product. Is that still considered um, hemp? And uh, that's probably a better question, I, I would say, for Dale Hunt or... Um, maybe uh, an attorney out there named Kite who has studied that a little bit more than I have. From our perspective, uh, we believe there is a basal level of THC getting folded probably by these other esoteric cannabinoids. Uh, and until we better understand those, we probably won't have a genetic prediction on below 0.3% uh, until we've solved that problem. Uh, the RNA will probably get very close, but in the event that the RNA levels don't fully predict 0.3s, we suspect it's probably these other terpene, I'm sorry, these other cannabinoid synthase genes that have a very basal or low level of THC expression that need to be followed um, genome to genome to see if they're, if they're the reason why some plants tend to occasionally be 0.3, but then occasionally pop hot to 1% under certain environmental conditions. I think that's what the, the question was trying to address, and we don't have a perfect resolution of that today. Great. Thank you. Um, so just going to spend a minute hitting a couple of more practical workflow uh, style questions. So Sarah, what is the average cost per smart cell? Um, for um, service providers, it would be for the SQL 2 system between $2,000 and $3,000 for one smart cell in the U.S., um, and it would be lower, about $1,300 if you own your instrument. So the, the, and that price is inclusive of the library prep. Great, thank you. And Kevin, um, what's the reason for gaps in the cannabis assembly? Um, so those could be several fold. I suspect centromeres are, are still broken as they are in the human genome. You know, they're just starting to close the centromeres with some of the um, technologies available today, like PacBio. Um, we probably need longer molecules out of the plant um, to close some of those. 
uh, right now, we're not taking full advantage out of the PacBio's read length because uh, the challenge in getting high molecular weight DNA out of the plant um, has been that it has been just a chronic problem. You'll see that through a variety of genome projects in cannabis, people are struggling to get molecules larger than 40 kb. Uh, when that is solved and people can get 100 kb or 200 kb, I think we'll start to see some of those holes get closed. Um, and I think those are important holes to close because in cannabis, there's a lot of interest in making polyploids, using colchicine, using a lot of things that may play a role in the kinetic core of the centromeres. And so we, we really do want to understand those regions uh, and are going to continue to press to try and close them. But uh, they're, they're probably gene poor uh, from what we uh, understand in, in other plants. So um, I think there's a lot we can get done with the reference we have, but I think the other holes are going to get closed as we get longer um, high molecular weight DNA out of the plant that can actually traverse those, uh, those regions. Great. And I've got another question here for you, Kevin, that I think, especially when talking about the long read length, is, uh, is an important one. So um, it's asked, is there one THC slash CBD synthase, or is it two separate loci? So um, let me see. we see m multiple different loci for, for um, THC synthase. There's three contigs that we're paying close attention to. One has the cannabichromine um, sequences, because those are very closely related to THC synthase. And there's some theory out there from um, a team out in Oregon that those may be playing a role in, in basal levels of, um, of cannabichromine expression from uh, Oregon CBD. Uh, and that's a very good hypothesis. Um, there's 90 other um, regions of the genome that have PFAM similarity to synthases, and so they may, that may not be the only one that's causing it. Uh, although we do tend to see that cannabichromine cluster is not present in a lot of hemp lines. Uh, and so that cluster may be disappearing in structural variation uh, throughout the genome. And then we see a, another very large 5 megabase contig that has THC synthase on it, uh, and then a separate contig that has CBD synthase on it. And now we're, uh, we are not, uh, we tried to put all of these things into a haploid state. So there are alternate contigs. This is a diploid plant. There are alternate contigs of those sequences in our alt contig bucket. Uh, but when we're, when we're displaying genomes here, we tend to resolve them into a, a, a haplotypic structure so that you're only seeing one THC allele, one CBD allele, when there's in reality there are, in fact, two in every genome, but sometimes they're not functional on each, on each allele. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, and uh, another one for you, Kevin, um, one I'm definitely interested in. Um, it's asked, have you examined comparative genetics between the hops and cannabis genomes? And if not, are there any, is there anything particular you expect to find from that type of study? Um, so we have done some work there. Uh, three of the samples in the Illumina um, sequencing study uh, that we had there, where we did 40 genomes, uh, have some hops background to them. Um, these are things that people have been attempting to cross with hops uh, and uh, may or may not have been successful. We're still trying to sort that out. But uh, we do think it's a very valuable resource. There's other pathways in hops that are, are very interesting uh, and may complement the pathways in, in cannabis. So there's, there's, a reason, there's good reason to do this. The hops genome is larger. Uh, it's, it's harder to sequence because of its size. Um, it, it's probably in a similar N50 state, I would guess, by now, because um, they have been deploying a lot of pack bio on it. But uh, we have not done whole genome alignments yet, and it's, uh, it's something that uh, we're looking at doing to resolve some of the sex chromosomes and perhaps to look through uh, any of the sex-determining loci that might be involved in hermaphroditism. Okay, great. Um, so we do have a few more questions. However, we are um, at our allotted time. So um, anybody who has questions submitted that didn't hear their answer, um, don't fret. We will follow up via email to make sure you get your answers. Um, but for now, I'd like to thank Sarah and Kevin for their time today and the terrific presentations they shared. In closing, I wanted to briefly mention kind of three things. First, we have recorded this webinar and we'll have it available for download in the next few days. So keep an eye out for that follow-up email with a link to the recording. Uh, secondly, you can stay up to date on upcoming webinars, as well as conferences and trade shows you can meet with us at by visiting and bookmarking pacb.com slash events. And finally, if you have an interesting research project that could benefit from smart sequencing, uh, consider applying for one of our smart grants and win free sequencing. For more information, you can visit pacb.com slash smart grant. Um, so thanks again for joining us today, and I hope you'll join us again on a future webinar. And with that, take care and have a wonderful day.